In this procedural update, we join Dr. Deron Schur, orthopedic surgeon specialising in knee and shoulder surgery. Hello, my name is Deron Schur. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and I specialise in knee and shoulder surgery. I work at the Randwick and Concord offices of Orthosports and I'm a VMO and the former head of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Concord Hospital. There's nothing particularly difficult about making an orthopaedic diagnosis with 90% of the time the diagnosis being made from the history. A simple clinical examination simply confirms this diagnosis. We'll discuss more of this later. Orthopaedic examination is simply a question of remembering your anatomy and examining each part of the joint so that your diagnosis can become clear. The segment that follows here is examination of the shoulder joint. The examination depends on the patient's history, whether we're looking for impingement, rotator cuff tears, arthritis or instability. A great deal of that will be guided by the patient's age. The younger the patient is, the more likely it is to be instability, and the older the patient is, the more likely it is to be rotator cuff pathology. Osteoarthritis in the shoulder is rare because it's not a weight-bearing joint. As we start the examination, we have a general inspection of the patient to see are their shoulders sitting at the same height, is there any obvious muscle wasting or scars. It's important to undress the patient and watch them undress for any trick movements that they might do in order to get their shirt off. Would you mind removing your shirt for me now? So you saw he didn't use his right arm at all there. What he did was he kept his right arm down and pulled his left arm to pull the shirt over his head. If we now generally inspect, we'll just turn this way a little bit more, very good. We see that the right shoulder is held slightly lower than the left, there is deltoid muscle wasting and we note the tattoos in the various areas. When we look more closely on the right side, we'll see the scars from previous surgical operations. I ask the patient to turn around for me, keep going, and I inspect their back. I look and feel even though it's out of sequence, for muscle wasting in the supra and infraspinatus fossae because it's a bit difficult to see that only. We're looking for lumps around the acromioclavicular joint and a scoliosis at the back over here. We can do some of the movements from the back and some of the movements from the front. While I've got the patient facing this way, I'll ask them to lift their arms forward. So lift your arm forward straight up in front of you, both arms if you would, as high as you can. Okay, now I'm watching his face for pain there. I see that this arm wings the scapula just a little bit. He's in pain while he's doing it, so I'll ask him to come back down again. Having seen the scapular rhythm from the back, I then ask the patient to turn around again to face me. I do some screening tests at this stage. Put your chin on your chest for me. Lift your head up to the sky. Put your ear on your left shoulder. Put your ear on your right shoulder. Turn your head sideways there and there. Does that reproduce any of the pain in your arm? Okay, so pain up in the trapezius region is typically from cervical spine pathology rather than rotator cuff pathology or shoulder problems. So I'm not concerned if a patient describes pain in their trapezius region from cervical spine movements. I'm only concerned if it travels down into the forearm or hand because that all is always from the cervical spine rather than the shoulder. We then start active movements. Elbow straight, thumbs out in front. Try and lift the arms up as far up as you can. You can see his left arm reaches comfortably 180 degrees. We can see he's, also, he's already worried about me doing this and I can get him to 90 degrees before he feels pain. Come back down again for me now. There was also subacromial crepitus at that point. Having seen what his movement is and the fact that it's so limited on the side, I'm now going to do a palpation of his various bony prominences the sternoclavicular joint, the clavicle, coming out to the acromioclavicular joint, the acromion itself, and I'm feeling in this case, because he's had surgical scars, to see whether the deltoid is in fact intact, but it is in his situation, there's no defect. I palpate the spine of the scapula down the back and the body of the scapula. At the front, I palpate the coracoid, I palpate the rotator cuff, feeling for crepitus, and the joint itself, feeling for pain and loss of motion. And this shoulder is very irritable, indicating the rotator cuff pathology. I inspect the axilla to make sure there's no scars or sinuses that might indicate chronic infection, particularly when the patient has had previous surgery and you're not sure whether they've had an infection there or not. 
we come next to strength testing. Put the arms up in front of you. With the arms straight in front, we want the patient to be able to externally rotate against resistance. So push your arms outwards against me, push, 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 push. The right arm collapses in, indicating external rotation weakness. We then go to internal rotation, and he has weakness of that side as well, and that created pain. Sorry, take a break. Okay, come back up like this. In this situation, we're now looking for the long head of biceps to see whether it's ruptured. And by pulling the arms upwards, we're stressing brachialis and biceps, looking for an abnormal contour or what we call the Popeye sign. Having tested external and internal rotation power, we then want to try and isolate supraspinatus. Now this might be difficult if it's, if it's hard for the patient to get their arm into that position. So let's just try that if you can. Let's try and get the arms up to 90 degrees with the arm and then thumb down over there. And what you'll see here is that he's hitched his shoulder. So this shoulder is nice and level, but the shoulder's pitched up and he's in pain. So this is not a good test because automatically I'm going to get weakness there and I wouldn't be clear whether it was pain mediated weakness or true weakness of the rotator cuff. Either way, it doesn't matter. He certainly has weakness when testing his supraspinatus. I'll then turn him around and do his subscapularis. So this being the normal arm, lift it up your back as high as you can go. Good, and his internal rotation is to T7. Bring the arm, hold it away from your bum in the, in the region of the sacrum, press up against my hand, and I'm unable to get his hand against his back. This arm here, you can see his internal rotation is significantly less, and when I try to get his arm up off his back, he's simply unable to reach the um, off the back at all, indicating significant weakness of subscapularis, so there's nothing that I can test there. Right, thank you, put the arm back down. All right, turn around to face me. Now, doing Nears and Hawkins signs in this situation is going to be very painful for the patient. Uh, we've seen already that even si the simplest movements of his shoulder create pain for him. So we can do them, but if we do do them, we have to do them very, very gently holding the arm, looking at his face, and as soon as he starts to experience pain, which is there at 60 degrees, I'm not going to force him through pain. I'm going to do the Nears impingement sign, holding his arm, feeling for crepitus, looking at his face, and lifting at the same time. There he's got pain at 60 degrees. There's very little point trying to push him through that. Now, if I believe he's got a painful arc, what I can do is do what's called the impingement test, where I inject local anesthetic into the subacromial space and then re-examine the patient and see whether that takes away the pain just through that painful arc and then they can keep moving their arm. But that's for another day. You've been watching another Medical Observer procedural update. Medical Observer brings life to medicine.